Good evening aspirants. I want to share with you an important update. Our academy, that is Shankar IS Academy, has launched a new app. This app is available free for download in the Google Play Store. See, prelims is fast approaching. There is only 87 days more. This last stage of preparation is very crucial. It will decide whether you make or don't make in the examination. See, presently, information is dumped in the internet. There is excess of information in the internet. So, sometimes aspirants might get overwhelmed by the fact that there is so much of information. So, this is where the app comes in. This is an holistic app. It is an integrated app. Okay. If you want to prepare and revise your current affairs, there is a tab for that. It will help you in the prelims If you help, it will help you in the prelims perspective. If you want to enhance your main skills, you can view our news analysis video there. There is a tab for that too. And if you want to hone in your uh, static skills, you can take daily quiz in the app itself. There is a tab for that also. See, in addition to this. You can even make admissions in our academy through the app itself. So, this is an wholesome app. If you use it effectively, it will help you in your prelims and mains preparation. So, don't waste time. Install the app and use it effectively. With this good news, I want to invite you all to the daily news analysis discussion session by Shankar A.S. Academy for the dates 8th and 9th of March 2022. See. These are the list of articles we will be discussing today. Four articles are from the yesterday's newspaper. That is the that is 8th March newspaper. And four articles are from today's newspaper. That is 9th March newspaper. Now, let us get into today's discussion. See this text and context article here. It explains about the office of the governor. It talks about the decisions taken by the constitution makers in the constituent assembly regarding the governor and also the different provisions that were discussed regarding the post of the governor in the constituent assembly. See, this article also contains the recommendations of the different committees for the better functioning of the constitutional post. So, this is the overall picture. Now, we will discuss each and every part. Before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted here the syllabus that will be covered during this discussion. You can go through it. Now, we will start our discussion from the constituent assembly. See, this is before adopting the Constitution of India and still debates are going on over the different articles that are to be included. Now, let us take a quick detour here to see some facts. See, the Constitution of India was adopted on 26th November 1949 and it came into effect on 26th January 1950. See, the Indian National Congress on 19th December 1929 passed the historic Purnaswara resolution that is total independence resolution at its Lahore session. This session was headed by our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. And after this a public declaration was made on 26th January 1930. A day which the Congress party urged the Indians to celebrate as Independence Day. Okay. So this is why 26th January was chosen in which the constitution came into effect. Okay. Now, where are we? Oh, yeah. In the Constituent Assembly. See, while discussing about the Governor post, the Constitution makers did not anticipate that the office of the Governor would turn into the most controversial constitutional office. They thought it was meant to preserve, protect and defend the Constitution and the law. See, the original draft of the Constitution provided for either the direct election or the appointment of the Governor. Here, direct election in the sense elected by the adult franchise and appointment in the sense a governor appointed by the president from a panel of four candidates elected by the legislative assembly but after elaborate discussion the constituent assembly voted for the third provision which is the nomination provision this was done because an elected governor may lead to conflict and waste of both energy and money and this was strongly supported by Jawaharlal Nehru now, let us see the views of other constitution makers regarding the post of the governor. See, Dr. Ambedkar said on the floor that the governor under the constitution has no functions which he can discharge by himself. 
that is no functions at all while he has no functions he has certain duties to perform so this shows the mentality of the constitution makers in the constituent assembly instead of a powerful governor the constitution conceived a duty bound governor okay finally a process by which the governor is nominated by the president by warrant under his hand and seal was adopted and it became article 155 of the enacted constitution okay so that is how the election to the post of governor was decided now let us see some recommendations of the committee in regards to governor okay see the president's rule was imposed in states over 100 times prior to 1994 a classic example was a report by the then governor k k shah seeking the dismissal of the dnk government in tamil nadu for pervasive corruption and therefore president's rule was imposed on february 3 1976 this was following the infamous national emergency of 1975 but after the supreme court's judgment in sr bombay case such rampant practices came to an end okay as supreme court declared that the imposition of president's rule shall be confined only to the breakdown of constitutional machinery okay way before this judgment a three member commission headed by justice r s sarkaria was constituted by the central government in 1983 and it remains the bedrock of inquiry into the relationship between center and state even in 1994 bombay judgment the supreme court quoted many provisions from the sarkaria commission on center and state relations now let us see the recommendations of the sarkaria commission the sarkaria commission recommended that the governor shall be a eminent person in some walk of life someone outside the respective state so that he or she would not have an personal interest to protect in the state and regarding the role of governor as the chancellor of the state universities the sarkaria commission was of the view that it is desirable to consult the chief minister or the concerned minister though it shall be left to the governor to act on the same or not as a matter of fact the first administrative reforms commission in 1966 in its report on central state relations has recommended strongly that once the governor completes his term of 5 years he shall not be made for further appointment as governor and next comes the national commission 2000 which reiterated the views of the sarkaria commission regarding the appointment okay it also said that there should be a time limit desirably 6 months to give assent or to reserve a bill for the consideration of the president okay if the bill is reserved for the consideration of president there shall be a time limit desirably 3 months within which the president should either take a decision to give his assent or to direct the governor to return it to the state legislature or to seek the advisory opinion of the supreme court next comes the punchi commission on central state relations in 2007 punchi commission affirmed most of the recommendations of the sarkaria commission and its views reflected the changing times and its needs see the commission did not appreciate the practice of governors being called back because of the regime change at the center see in the bp singal case 2010 the supreme court declared that a change in power at the center cannot be the grounds to recall governor and hence such actions are judicially reviewable now coming back to the recommendations of punchi commission see punchi commission recommended that governor shall have a fixed term so that they wouldn't hold office under the pressure of the central government it proposed an amendment to article 156 so that there should be a procedure to remove the governor from office it went further in recommending that governor shall not be overburdened with the task of running universities by virtue of them being made chancellors under the state universities act so this is all regarding this article here see you can use these points as such in your main answer each and every point discussed under this article is very important and we saw in the beginning that the post of governor has become one of the most controversial one what we have in this article is one of the most evergreen topic as far as upsc is concerned so adding to what we discussed now study the articles related to the governor from the constitution through this you can cover the topic of governor holistically and uh, if there is any questions regarding governor 
you can answer it holistically okay so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this news article the news article states that the first regional conclave on disaster management was organized see a conclave means a gathering or a conference and this conclave on disaster management aims to provide a platform for sharing the challenges faced in disaster management through this platform the states will come together and will be able to learn the best practices from each other okay the conclave was organized by the ndma that is national disaster management authority in coordination with the tamil nadu state disaster management authority so for prelims angle let us see few crucial facts about national disaster management authority as the name suggests it is the apex body for disaster management in india ndma was constituted in 2005 by a executive order of the government so while it was constituted it was formed through a executive order but subsequently later that year the disaster management act of 2005 was also enacted so in 2006 National Disaster Management Authority was notified under the provisions of the Disaster Management Act as it mandates the constitution of the National Disaster Management Authority. Now let us see the organizational structure of NDMA. See, NDMA is headed by the Prime Minister of India who is the ex officio chairperson of NDMA. Remember this fact, okay? It also has a maximum of 9 members and these 9 members are nominated by the chairperson that is the prime minister of india ndma also has a secretariat the secretariat is headed by a secretary with five joint secretaries or advisors it also includes one financial advisor having seen the organizational structure now let us see its function the main function of ndma is to ensure timely and effective response to disasters so the act has listed several responsibilities in this regard first is obviously laying down policies on disaster management see currently we have national policy on disaster management 2009 national policy on disaster management provides for the holistic management of disasters with emphasis on prevention preparedness and mitigation along with response note that national policy on disaster management is in conformity with the international standard for disaster reduction the rio declaration and then the millennium development goals and the hyogo framework 2005 to 2015 then the national disaster management authority also approves the national plan which is the plan for disaster management for the whole of the country it is prepared under the section 11 of the act so ndma prepared the first national disaster management plan in 2016 this plan was revised in 2019 as National Disaster Management Plan 2019 The National Disaster Management Authority also lays down guidelines that is the guidelines for the state authorities for drawing up the state plan and also guidelines to be followed by the different ministries or departments of government of India the aim behind charting out the guidelines is to integrate the measures for prevention of disaster National Disaster Management Authority also exercises a general superintendence direction and control of the national disaster response force that is ndrf as you know ndrf is constituted under the act that is the disaster management act 2005 the purpose for constituting a dedicated national disaster response force is to provide specialist response to a threatening disaster situation or an actual disaster now moving on to the next function National Disaster Management Authority also lays down broad policies and guidelines for the functioning of National Institute of Disaster Management. See, National Institute of Disaster Management has nodal responsibility for human resource development, capacity building, training, research, documentation and policy advocacy in the field of disaster management. The other roles and responsibilities of National Disaster Management Authority is listed here. You can go through it before concluding let us do a quick recap see in this discussion we saw some points about national disaster management authority national disaster management authority is the apex body of disaster management in india established under the disaster management act 2005 national disaster management authority is headed by the prime minister of india who is the ex officio chairperson 
it also has nine members nominated by the prime minister national disaster management authority also has a secretariat the secretariat is headed by a secretary with five joint secretaries or advisors of the five advisors there is one financial advisor its main functions include framing a national policy on disaster management approving the national plan on disaster management it also provides guidelines for the state authorities for drawing up the state plan national disaster management authority exercises a general superintendence direction and control over the national disaster response force and finally national disaster management authority also lays down broad policies and guidelines for the functioning of national institute of disaster management with this let us wind up this discussion and take up the next news article look at this editorial article this article briefly talks about the challenges faced by the women in the informal sector it states that more than 95% of india's working women are informal workers the women of the informal sector lack affordable services and maternity benefits the editorial mentions that women's informal work is central to the feminization of poverty this is the crux of this editorial in this context we will briefly discuss about feminization of poverty and the steps that can be taken to extend the child care services to women workers in informal sector see i have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion now let us start the discussion first of all we have to understand what feminization of poverty is see feminization of poverty refers to a trend of increasing inequality in living standards between men and women This is due to the widening gender gap in poverty. The feminization of poverty is simply the phenomenon in which women experience poverty at far higher rates than men. See worldwide women on average earn less than what men earn, okay? So some of the common causes of the feminization of poverty includes structure of family and household, mobility, political participation and patriarchy. Now we will briefly discuss about these causes. See we know that women are the primary caretakers of family and children and they are not getting paid for it most of their times is spent in unpaid household work this leaves them with less time to do something for themselves or to devote it for paid employment this is the primary cause of feminization of poverty the second cause is lack of mobility for women a woman living at a place where employment opportunities are limited might have to migrate somewhere to get better employment opportunity but having children and family to take care of does not allow her to move women as a social norm are made to take care of her family the patriarchal social norms dictate that for women her family should always come first this affects her ability to migrate in search of better employment the third cause is limited political participation Very few women get chance to participate in the political sphere. They contest election, but their voices are suppressed by powerful and patriarchal men. They cannot participate in political struggle because the social structure of the society is totally male dominated. Patriarchal mindset and traditional stereotyping has also promoted the poverty among women in South Asian countries mainly in India. See in South Asia only 28% of the women have jobs compared to 79% of men so in essence women are not given equal opportunities in jobs education and politics see in india feminization of poverty happens due to internal migration women are pushed to poverty in the source regions of migration say for example a unskilled migrant worker moves from southern tamil nadu to bangalore In most cases due to high cost of living in Bangalore he has to move alone leaving his family behind in this case if the money he makes in Bangalore is not sufficient for him he cannot send enough money to his wife at home this pushes her into poverty see this is a india specific scenario so in india internal migration causes feminization of poverty in the source region okay see so far we have discussed about feminization of poverty and the reasons for it Now let us come back to the editorial. See the International Labour Organization study states that more than 95% of the India's working women are in the informal sector. They work in labour intensive, low paying, highly precarious jobs with little to no social protection. Note that India is ahead of many advanced nations in instituting maternal health benefits. 
India's statutory maternal leave is among the global top 3. The Maternity Benefit Amendment Act 2017 more than doubled the duration of paid maternity leave for women employees to 26 weeks. It also proposed an option to work from home after this period on mutual agreement with the employer. It made crutch facilities mandatory for establishment employing 50 or more women. However, these benefits are mostly enjoyed by the formal sector women workers. They constitute less than 5% of the total women workforce in India. Remaining 95% of the women do not enjoy these benefits. So, India has paid less attention to address concerns around the child care support for informal women workers. So, the author of this editorial suggests three ways to empower women in the informal sector. By empowering women in the informal sector, they will be able to take up more productive paid work and they will also improve their maternal and child health outcomes. The three solutions stated in the editorial are extending the integrated child development services infrastructure, revitalizing the national crutches scheme and improving maternity benefits. Now we will discuss about these three solutions in detail. First is expansion of the integrated child development services. The primary mandate of the Anganwadi centers under the integrated child development services is to provide maternal and child nutrition security. It endeavors to provide a clean and safe environment and early childhood education. So, ICDS facilitates women to re-enter work post-childbirth. However, it has two major limitations. First is that it does not cater to children under the age of three. Second, it functions only for a few hours a day. So, it is inconvenient to send and pick up children during work hours. See, early intake of children in the Anganwadi centers can have dual benefits. First is that it gives time for the mothers to do paid work. And the other benefit is that it converges with the National Education Policy 2020 mandate that aims to provide quality early childhood care and education for children in the 0 to 6 age group. See, extending the hours of Anganwadi centers can also address the time constraint for working women. Okay. The second solution provided in the editorial is to revitalize the crutch scheme. See, the National Crutch Scheme aims to provide daycare facility to children of working mothers. The children are those who are in the age group of 6 months to 6 years. But the scheme has suffered diminished government funding and has implementation gaps. An inclusive approach is required to diversify work site and working hours and overcome these implementation gaps. Expanding a network of public and workplace crutches can be hugely beneficial. Public crutches can be operated at worksite clusters such as near industrial areas, markets, dense low-income residential areas, etc. See, crutches closer to the workplace allow for timely breastfeeding and attending to emergencies of the children. This model has been tested successfully by Self-Employed Women Association that is Seva Sagini in some Indian cities. Where work occurs at a single site such as garment factory or construction site, work site crutches will help. This can be seen in construction of site crutches run by Ajivika Bureau in Ahmedabad and mobile crutches in Delhi. Now coming to the third solution that is mentioned in the editorial, that is increasing maternity benefit. See, childbirth and child care are financially stressful. It compels many women to return to work within few weeks of childbirth. Women in the informal employment did not have maternity benefit until the National Food Security Act 2013. This act entitled pregnant and lactating mothers to a cash transfer of at least 6,000 rupees. However, the Pradhan Mandri Matru Vandana Yojana scheme limits the benefit to the first birth and has also reduced the amount to only 5,000 rupees. The cash transfer under the Pradhan Mandri Matru Vandana Yojana is insufficient. They are way below the National Food Security Act benchmark. They are insufficient to cover all the nutrition needs and wage compensation. The compensation which is lower than the minimum wages is inadequate in postponing the mother's return to work for the first six months. The amount also does not match an inflation adjusted National Food Security Act benchmark which is nearly 9400 rupees in 2020. 
சி மெனி ஸ்டேட் ஸ்கீம்ஸ் சச் அஸ் டாக்டர் முத்துலட்சுமி அம்மையார் மெட்டர்னிட்டி பெனிஃபிட் ஸ்கீம் ஆஃப் தமிழ்நாடு இந்திரா காந்தி மெட்டர்னிட்டி நியூட்ரிஷன் ஸ்கீம் ஆஃப் ராஜஸ்தான் அண்ட் மம்தா ஸ்கீம் ஆஃப் ஒடிசா ட்ரைஸ் டு பிரிட்ஜ் திஸ் கேப் For instance, Tamil Nadu has an expansive and ambitious scheme of offering 80,000 rupees in cash and kind for the first two live births. Okay. Lastly, universal and unconditional maternity entitlement should be implemented. It should cover at least 6 months of the minimum wages for pregnant women and lactating mothers. Kindly note that the lack of affordable and quality child care services and maternity benefits increases the burden on informal women workers. this aggravates gender and class inequalities so the affordable and quality child care infrastructure must be considered an employment linked benefit and as a public good that's all regarding this editorial see in this segment we discussed about feminization of poverty reasons for feminization of poverty lack of child care support for informal women workforce and the steps that the government can take to enhance the child care support to the informal women workforce With this, let us conclude this and take up the next news article discussion. Look at this article. This article talks about the National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited. The National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited was set up for the resolution of stressed assets. So, this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us see about the Asset Reconstruction Company. See, banks are financial institutions that are engaged principally in the business of money lending and money borrowing the customer base of the banking sector is very large and there is also a substantial risk involved in lending money while the banks always has the option of taking legal action on the defaulting borrowers it is not always economically feasible to do so the banks sometimes decide to just cut its losses clean up its balance sheets and keep the business moving towards better avenues this is where the asset reconstruction company comes in see banks rather than going after the defaulters by wasting their time and effort can sell the bad assets to the asset reconstruction company at a mutually agreed price an asset reconstruction company is a special type of financial institution that buys the debtors of the bank see the company buys at a mutually agreed value and attempts to recover the debts of associated securities by itself the asset reconstruction companies take over a portion of the debt of the bank that qualify to be recognized as non performing assets so asset reconstruction companies are engaged in the business of asset reconstruction or securitization or both the asset reconstruction companies or arcs are registered under the rbi and they are regulated under the securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of security interest act 2002 that is shortly called surface act 2002 all the rights that were held by the lender in respect to debt can be transferred to the asset reconstruction company the required funds to purchase such debts can be raised from qualified buyers okay see in india asset reconstruction companies function under the supervision and control of the reserve bank of india asset reconstruction companies are in business of securitization and reconstruction of financial assets they act strictly as per surface act and guidelines issued by the reserve bank of india the asset reconstruction companies acquire the bad debts or non performing assets from banks and financial institutions and try to resolve them by availing remedies under existing laws of india now we will see some basics regarding asset securitization and asset reconstruction now what is asset reconstruction see asset reconstruction means acquisition of any rights or interest of any bank or financial institution by an arc that is asset reconstruction company in any financial assistance for the purpose of realization okay now what is securitization securitization means acquisition of financial assets by an asset reconstruction company from banks or financial institutions by raising funds from qualified buyers by issue of security receipts to the qualified buyers see you can also go through this image for your better understanding 
If you want to know more about National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited, its role and the mechanism of changing bad loans, then watch our news analysis dated January 29, 2022. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this editorial article. This editorial talks about the demographic dividend and the decrease in female labor force participation rate. The authors have also mentioned the need for increasing female labor force participation rate, steps to be taken to increase female labor force participation rate, and the sectors from where the potential of the female workforce can be reaped. Okay, so in this context, let us discuss about what is demographic dividend, then its advantages for India. Then we will see about female labor force participation. Where we will discuss about the reasons for low female labor force participation in India, then the COVID-19 and its impact on female labor force participation. After this, we will discuss about the steps to be taken and the initiatives and the policy measures to be taken by the government to increase female labor force participation in India. Finally, let us see the sectors that can be concentrated for increasing female labor force participation. Okay. See, I have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion. Just go through it. Now let us start the discussion. Firstly, what is a demographic dividend? See, the demographic dividend is a result of an increase in the proportion of workers relative to non-workers in the population. If you see in terms of age in India, the working population covers those between 15 and 59 years of age. So, demographic dividend is the increase in the number of people in the age group of 15 to 59 relative to the people below the age of 15 and above the age of 60. In other words, demographic dividend refers to a country's economic growth resulting from a shift in the age structure of the country's population. Here, the shift is from the dependent population, which include the young and the old, to the working age groups of people. Usually, a decrease in fertility and mortality rates contribute to the transition in the age structure. Okay, now let us see the advantages that India can gain from the increasing demographic dividend. See, if there are more working age people, then it means more workers, mainly in the productive age group. As a result of this, there will be more income, which leads to more savings, which leads to more capital per worker, and finally, it will lead to more growth. Also note that this demographic change is associated with fertility decline so the transition period may be accompanied by greater female participation in the labor force okay the next advantage is the increase in human capital see the term human capital refers to the economic value of a worker's experience and skills human capital includes assets like education training intelligence skills and health See, like I already said, increase in demographic dividend will result in decreasing fertility. That is, there will be fewer births. So, with fewer births, parents are able to allocate more resources per child, leading to better educational and health outcomes. So, with increasing demographic dividend, human capital will increase. Okay, let me tell you one more advantage of this demographic dividend. See, demographic dividend supports the economic growth. See, we already saw there will be decrease in the dependency ratio with increasing demographic dividend. So, with increasing demographic dividend, the economic growth, that is GDP per capita, is increased due to the decrease in the dependency ratio. Okay. Till now, we saw about demographic dividend and the gains that India can make with increasing demographic dividend. Now, let us see about female labour force participation in India. See, female labor force participation can be defined as the number of women as a section of total population of women who are in the age group of 16 to 64 who currently employed or seeking employment. So, women who are not looking for a job, full-time women students, homemakers, women above the age of 64 will not be part of the female labor force participation rate. See, the issue now in India is that. the participation of women in the workforce has dropped it dropped from 32% working or looking for work in 2005 to just 21% in 2019 note that india's female labor force participation rate is the lowest among the brics countries which countries are part of the brics groupings the countries are 
பிரேசில் ரஷ்யா இந்தியா சைனா அண்ட் சவுத் ஆப்ரிக்கா ஓகே நோ கம்மிங் பேக் நோட் தட் இந்தியாஸ் ஃபீமேல் லேபர் ஃபோர்ஸ் பார்ட்டிசிபேஷன் ரேட் இஸ் லோவர் தென் மோஸ்ட் ஆஃப் இட்ஸ் சவுத் ஏஷியன் நெய்பர்ஸ் லைக் ஸ்ரீலங்கா அண்ட் பங்களாதேஷ் See, this shows the scenario of the present female labor force participation rate in India. Now, let us see why increasing the female labor force participation rate in India is crucial. See, firstly, increasing the female labor force participation rate will help achieve economic growth. This female labor force participation rate is an indicator of the country's potential to grow more rapidly. Okay. Secondly, and more importantly, increasing female labor force participation rate will promote inclusive growth and will help achieve the sustainable development goals like gender equality not only this increasing female labor force participation rate also helps in the achievement of other sustainable development goals like quality education decent work and economic growth see these are some of the advantages of increasing female labor force participation rate Now let us see the steps to be taken to increase the potential of the female labor force in India. Firstly, government must take steps to provide new skills and opportunities for women. Secondly, government must take steps to increase access to higher education and digital technology for women. Why are the above mentioned steps are important? See, post-COVID-19 pandemic, the gig economy, the platform economy and the care economy have all opened up fresh and flexible job opportunities mainly for women. We know that the need for personal care for the sick, elderly and the children have increased mainly during the pandemic period. So, it has opened up employment opportunities for many, mainly for women. Hence, providing digital and smartphone technology knowledge and access will help the women okay to achieve this government can motivate women and their families to take up higher education this is by providing incentives such as scholarships as well as transport and hostel facilities then the government can make ways to enable women to acquire free access to internet and to have a smartphone See these are some basic requirements to develop their skills mainly in the digital economy or digital technology then the states should provide safe transport and travel to work lastly the government can take up steps to better collection of data to capture women's contribution to the economy see for instance gender related data from the annual periodic labor force survey can help develop more targeted policies for women in rural and urban areas Using this data, government can work on targeted strategies like providing maternity benefits for women in the informal sectors. Okay. Also note that in financial year 2022, an announcement was made in the budget. The announcement says that the benefits of social security schemes will be extended to gig and platform workers. See, these are the steps that the government can take to increase the potential of female labor force in India. Lastly let us see what are all the sectors with potential for increasing the female labor force participation rate in India Firstly the health sector see according to the united nation women women make up a significant proportion of all healthcare workers estimates show that more than 80% of nurses and midwives are women so increasing investment in the care economy has the potential to generate a total of 69 million jobs in india by 2030 this is indicated in a ilo report that is international labor organization report the second important sector with potential for increasing female labor force participation rate is the education sector see women form a significant proportion of the workforce in this sector in india mainly in primary education and early childhood care so there is potential for growth in the education sector also thirdly take the gig and the platform economy see india has emerged as one of the largest countries for gig and platform work this is due to the thriving digital platforms low entry barriers okay this is due to the thriving digital platform and low entry barriers Also note that many studies indicate that women appreciate the income generating potential of the gig economy as evidence for this in the ILO global survey 2021 it is noted that working from home or job flexibility are particularly important for women 
to more about this gig economy watch our hindu news analysis on 2nd march 2022 okay so in conclusion health sector education sector and the gig and platform sector has potential to increase labor force participation rate in india so if the government takes the steps that we discussed and give importance to the health sector education sector and the gig and the platform sectors more women can be brought into the formal economic system this will help improve long term economic growth achieve gender equality and achieve societal well being this is all about this editorial see in this discussion we saw what is demographic dividend and the advantages that india can gain from increasing demographic dividend then we saw what is female labor force participation and the present scenario of the female labor force participation rate in india and we also saw that why increasing female labor force participation is crucial for india then we saw the sectors that have the potential to increase the female labor force participation and finally before concluding we saw the steps that the government can take to increase the potential of female labor force with this discussed points let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this news article as per the news article pakistan's opposition parties filed a no confidence motion against prime minister imran khan on tuesday they filed the no confidence motion to try and remove him from the office after accusing his government for the uncontrolled inflation so this is the crux of the news article given here In this context let us quickly go through the no confidence motion in India. First we know that in parliamentary terminology motion refers to any formal proposal made by a member with the intent of obtaining a house decision. Any matter of importance can be the subject of a motion. And uh, what is a motion of no confidence? As you know a government can only operate if it has majority in the Lok Sabha. the party can remain in power when it shows its strength through a floor test which is primarily taken to know whether executive enjoys the confidence of the legislature or not so just to check whether the government enjoys majority in lok sabha or not a no confidence motion can be introduced this motion can be introduced by any member of the house who believes that the government in power lacks a majority if the motion is approved the ruling party must demonstrate that it has a majority in the house also remember a no confidence motion need not set out any ground on which it is based even when grounds are mentioned in the notice and read out in the house they need not form part of the no confidence motion here you might have a doubt who actually approves the motion see as i already said no confidence motion can be moved by any member of the house here house means i am talking about only lok sabha so any member of lok sabha can move a no confidence motion but for that speaker's permission is required first and the motion has to be supported by at least 50 mps remember sometimes the speaker can also refuse to admit the motion to if the speaker accepts the motion the speaker will set a date for the motion's discussion the allotted date has to be within 10 days from the day the motion is accepted otherwise the motion fails and the member who moved the motion will be informed about it that's all regarding this discussion before concluding let us do a quick recap no confidence motion can be passed by any member of the house who believes that the government in power lacks a majority note that only members of the lok sabha can introduce no confidence motion see speaker's permission is required first and the motion has to be supported by at least 50 mps for the no confidence motion to be introduced remember sometimes the speaker can refuse to admit the motion to the no confidence motion need not include the reason why it is introduced if the motion is approved the ruling party must demonstrate that it has the majority in the house that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this news article this news article talks about a study conducted by the zoological survey of india it has been found that 214 species are facing the threat of extinction this shocking data was found out during a regional level assessment carried out in kerala out of this 214 species which are facing the threat of extinction experts recommended 37 species for notification 
This is under section 38 of the Biological Diversity Act 2002. See, this is done for ensuring their conservation by the Kerala State Biodiversity Board. This is the essence of the news article here. So, in this backdrop, let us quickly discuss about the Biological Diversity Act 2002. See, Biological Diversity Act was enacted in 2002. This is mainly to realize the objectives enshrined in the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, 1992. This UN Convention recognizes the sovereign rights of states to use their own biological resources. Now, let us see the aims of this act. Firstly, it aims to provide for conservation of biological diversity. Secondly, it aims to ensure the sustainable use of components of biological diversity. And finally, it aims for fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the use of biological resources and knowledge. See, the Biological Diversity Act provides for a three-tier structure. What are they? First is the National Biodiversity Authority at the apex. Then, the State Biodiversity Board at provincial level. And finally, District Biodiversity Management Committee at the local body level. Now, let us see some points about each tier that we saw now. First, take the National Biodiversity Authority. It is established by the central government. Its main role is to advise the central government in achieving the aims of the Act. What are the aims of the Act? The Biodiversity Act 2002 aims to provide for conservation of biological diversity. Then for the sustainable use of the components of biological diversity. And finally, it aims for the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the use of biological resources and knowledge. Okay, now coming back. See, the National Biodiversity Authority advises the state government in the selection of areas of biological or biodiversity importance. This is to notify the area as heritage site and even advises regarding the measures for the management of such heritage sites. Most importantly, the National Biodiversity Authority takes any measures necessary to oppose the grant of intellectual property rights in any country outside India. See, this intellectual property rights is for any biological resources obtained from India or knowledge associated with such biological resources which is derived from India. Okay. Now, let us see some points about State Biodiversity Boards. See, State Biodiversity Boards are established by the state governments in accordance with this Biological Diversity Act 2002. Here, the role of the State Biological Board is firstly to advise the state government. The advices should be subject to the central government guidelines. These guidelines is on matters relating to the conservation, sustainable use and sharing of equitable benefits arising from the biological resources. Secondly, the state biodiversity boards regulate by granting approvals or otherwise request for commercial utilization or biosurvey and bio-utilization of any biological resources by Indians. Lastly, before concluding, let us see some points about Biodiversity Management Committees. See, every local body shall constitute a Biodiversity Management Committee within its area. This is for the purpose of promoting conservation and sustainable use. Also, the main purpose of Biodiversity Management Committee is to document the biological diversity. This includes preservation of habitats, conservation of land racers, folk varieties and cultivars, domestic stocks and breeds of animals. It also includes microorganisms and chronicling of knowledges relating to biological diversity. Just have a look at this image to know what is cultivars, fork varieties and land races. Note that Biological Management Committee may levy charges by way of collection fees. This is for accessing or collecting any biological resources for commercial purposes. These resources should be from areas falling within its territorial jurisdiction. See, the National Biodiversity Authority and the State Biodiversity Boards shall consult the Biodiversity Management Committee. This is done while taking any decision relating to the use of biological resources and biological knowledge. So, this is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw some important points related to the Biological Diversity Act 2002. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this news article. This article states that the center is launching a back-to-school campaign to bring at least 4 lakh young girls who are out of school into the formal education system. The article also mentions about the Saksham Anganwadi scheme. 
in this context let us learn about saksham anganwadi scheme and some important points mentioned in the article see the integrated child development scheme anganwadi services or the saksham anganwadi service or scheme was designed to upgrade the anganwadi infrastructure and transform them into learning and healthcare centers for children saksham anganwadis are a new generation anganwadis that have better infrastructure and audio visual aids Saksha Manganwadi are powered by clean energy and provide improved environment for early child development. Note that this scheme that is the Saksha Manganwadi scheme is implemented by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. See in the financial year 2021-22 the government of India restructured the integrated child development services and the Poshan Abhiyan into Saksha Manganwadi and Poshan 2.0. The stated objectives of this restructuring was to converge the nutrition related initiatives of the Ministry of Women and Child Development. The restructured scheme consists of the following sub schemes. The sub schemes are Integrated Child Development Scheme, Poshan Abhiyan, Scheme for Adolescent Girls and National Crutch Scheme. See the Saksha Manganwadi and the Poshan 2.0 is the largest scheme of Ministry of Women and Child Development. In the financial year 2022-23 budget estimate, 20,263 crore was allocated to the scheme. This was 1% higher than the previous year's revised estimate, which stood at 20,000 crores. We have seen that the center is launching a back to school campaign to bring at least 4 lakh young girls who are out of school into the formal education system. See, under the new Saksha Manganwadi scheme. these girls in the 11 to 14 age group will no longer receive anganwadi support because the focus of the new scheme now shifts to the 14 to 18 year olds the campaign to enroll these girls in school will be driven by anganwadi workers now let us see a survey report of unicef see unicef conducted survey of about 50000 indian adolescents 90% of the respondents of the survey were currently enrolled in one school One third of them, that is around seventeen thousand of them, knew at least one girl who had dropped out. This figure is huge, right? The dropouts were either engaged in domestic work or had gotten married. The report added that at least one third of the girls wished to return to school. The respondents suggested strategies to convince parents to ensure girls' safety in school and to commute and to provide better awareness of government programs. See, the government have achieved some success in bringing adolescent girls into the school system. This could be seen in the sharp fall in dropout of girls who are dependent on the anganwadi system for nutritional and skill support. In 2018-19 there were 11 lakh 88000 girls aged 11 to 14 years who were part of the scheme for adolescent girls in anganwadis but this has dropped to 5 lakh 3000 by 2021 with the new saksham anganwadi focusing on the 14 to 18 year olds it is expected that 4 lakh young girls who are out of schools will be absorbed by the school system this is all regarding this news article With this let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. We have five practice prelims questions today. Let's see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. This question is in regards to Biological Diversity Act 2002. Two statements are given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take up the first statement. Foreigners can do any biological activity in India without any permission. See this statement is wrong because according to the act that is the biological diversity act 2002 foreigners can do any biological activity in india only after getting the permission from the national biodiversity authority now let us take up the second statement biodiversity management committee plays the key role in documenting the biological diversity in its jurisdiction see this statement is correct actually according to the act biodiversity management committee plays the key role in documenting the biological diversity in its jurisdiction So since statement 1 is wrong and statement 2 is correct the correct option here is option B 2 only now let us take up the second question this question is in regards to saksham anganwadi scheme here also two statements are given we have to find the correct statements let us take the first statement saksham anganwadi scheme is implemented by the ministry of health and family welfare see this statement is wrong 
बिकॉज फ्रॉम अवर डिस्कशन वी नो दैट साक्षम अंगनवाड़ी स्कीम इज इंप्लीमेंटेड बाई द मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ वुमन एंड चाइल्ड डेवलपमेंट ओके Now let us take up the second statement. Government of India reconstructed the Integrated Child Development Services Poshan Abhiyan Scheme for Adolescent Girls and National Crutch Scheme into Saksham Anganwadi and Poshan 2.0. See, statement two here is correct. We have seen in our discussion that the restructured scheme consists of four schemes. That is ICDS Poshan Abhiyan Scheme for Adolescent Girls National Crutch Scheme. So. Since statement one is incorrect and statement two is correct, the correct answer here is option B, two only. Look at the third question. This question is in regards to disaster management. Two statements are given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take up the first statement. The Disaster Management Act 2005 envisages the creation of authorities at the national, state, and the district level. See, this statement is correct because. Disaster Management Act mandates the creation of National Disaster Management Authority and also mandates for the creation of an enabling environment for an institutional mechanism at the state and district level. In this way, it creates the State Disaster Management Authority and the District Disaster Management Authority. Both state authority and the district authority is established by the state governments. In the case of state authority, it is established in each state, and the chief minister of the state is the ex officio chairperson. Similarly, in the case of district authority, it is constituted for every district in the state. The collector or the district magistrate or the deputy commissioner of the district is the ex officio chairperson. Now, let us take up the second statement. The Hyogo framework for action and the Sendai framework are international efforts in disaster risk reduction. See, this statement is also correct. The Hyogo framework's full name is Framework for Action 2005 to 2015, Building the Resilience of Nations and Communities to Disaster. It was adopted in 2005 in Kobe, Hyogo, Japan, during the World Conference on Disaster Reduction. It was a global blueprint for disaster risk reduction with a 10-year plan from 2005 to 2015. Then in 2015. The third United Nations World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction was held in Sendai, Japan. Here, the successor of Hyogo Framework was adopted, which is the Sendai Framework. Its full name is the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015 to 2030. The Sendai Framework outlines seven global targets which have to be achieved by 2030. The seven global targets of Sendai Frameworks are given here. You can go through it. Now let us take up the fourth question. This question is in regards to no confidence motion. Three statements are given. Note here we have to find the incorrect statements. Let us take up the first statement. It can be moved only in Lok Sabha. See this statement is correct because a no confidence motion can be moved by any member of the house. That is, it can be moved only in the Lok Sabha and not Rajya Sabha. Now let us take up the second statement. The procedure for no confidence motion is laid down in the Rules of Procedure and Conduct of Business of Lok Sabha. See, this statement is also correct because Rule 198 of the Rules of Procedure and Conduct of Lok Sabha specifies the procedure for moving a no confidence motion. It is totally the affairs of the Lok Sabha. Now, let us take up the third statement. In case there is a tie, the speaker can cast his vote. See, this statement is also correct. Following the vote. The person who has the majority will be allowed to form the government. If the government is not able to prove its majority in the house, then the government of the day has to resign. In case there is a tie, the speaker can cast his vote. Since all the statements are correct here, and the question is asking us to find the incorrect statement, the correct option is option D, none of the above. Now let us take up the last and final prelims practice question. This question is in reference to asset reconstruction company. Two statements are given. We have to find the correct statements. Let us take up the first statement. Asset reconstruction company involves transfer of the ownership of the bank which has bad loans and non-performing assets. See this statement is completely wrong. This is because the asset reconstruction company does not involve in the transfer of the ownership of the bank. See, asset reconstruction company is a type of financial institution that buys the debtors of the bank, 
and it attempts to recover the debts or associated securities by itself so statement 1 is incorrect now let us take up the second statement the asset reconstruction companies functions under the supervision and control of rbi see this statement is correct because in our discussion we saw that the asset reconstruction companies or arcs are registered under the rbi and regulated under the securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of securities act 2002 going by this the statement 2 here is correct since statement 1 is wrong and statement 2 is correct the correct answer here is option b 2 only the main question based on today's discussion is displayed here write your answers and post it in the comment section if you like today's discussion like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation subscribe to shankar as academy youtube channel thank you